I wanted to talk essentially about the people that are the worst victims of the uh, international credit crisis, but also the worst victims of economic injustice around the world. I represent Islington North in Parliament in a city community, and I'm very proud to represent Islington North. And I get people coming to me frequently who are um, people that have come to this country, that have sought asylum, that have been refused asylum, that um, were going through an appellate process, they are denied any access to benefits, they're denied any access to housing, they're denied any access to money, they're denied any access to work, and they have to live a twilight existence, sometimes for many years. They may or may not be successful in their case. If they manage to stay 14 years, they're almost certainly likely to be granted a right of permanent residence, having served a time of 14 years of this twilight existence. Imagine what that does to normal life, where a parking ticket, a driving offence, any kind of involvement in anything that involves the police or anything else is potentially a sentence to depo deportation or removal. It leads to a sense of fear, it leads to a position of vulnerability, it leads to exploitation. Minimum wage doesn't apply, health and safety doesn't apply, nothing applies. I had a man come to me once who was terrified that he'd witnessed a stabbing in front of him in the street. He wanted to report it because he it was a good witness. He'd seen what had happened. He'd seen who the culprit was. And he was terrified of reporting it because, for him, it would mean deportation. That is the effect of this twilight existence that is led by people, not just in London, in every capital city in Europe and all over the United States at the present time. Last year, I went to a seminar organised by a combination of the United Nations High Commission of Refugees, International Labour Organisation and Interparliamentary Union on migrant workers in general around the world. There are 200 million people that are migrant workers. Not all migrant workers go from the south to the north. Quite a lot go between south and south countries from, for example, well, the news at the moment is Zimbabwe into South Africa, but many countries into South Africa, in South America, many countries into Brazil, any place where there's any possibility of any sort of increase in living standards or possibility of earning a living. These people are then often denied access to any kind of um, justice, to labour systems, to decency of treatment. For, and this leads to a huge degree of um, disciplined mal maltreatment of such workers. Uh, for example, Dubai is seen as the great economic giant of the region now. Fantastic buildings going up, fantastic roads being developed, and an uh, area of great growth if environmentally totally unsustainable and frankly quite obscene for what it's trying to achieve. Yet, just outside the main city of Dubai, there are barracks where the building workers are housed in almost military prison-like conditions where they leave those barracks at five or six in the morning, spend the day building these palaces of plastic, stainless steel and glass um, for the world's rich or aspirant rich to come and live in, and then go back to these barracks in the evening, and at the end of their contract, they are paid whatever they're due to be paid if they're lucky and then taken back to Bangladesh, the Philippines, India, Pakistan or whatever and simply dumped there. And that is the economic relationship that's developing. And so the reason I wanted to talk about this is this is very much the fourth world. People of desperate, in a desperate situation trying to either avoid political persecution or to avoid an environmental disaster or to simply avoid starvation and living in desperate poverty fleeing to another part of the world to try to eke out a living. And the response so often of the West is to um, mouth platitudes at endless length about the UN Declaration of Human Rights, about human rights, and about how we're exporting human rights and a human rights agenda around the world. All the while, promoting an economic strategy, an economic investment strategy, and imposing an economic strategy on the poorest countries in the world that creates the problem in the first place. And uh, the latest response on immigration, to have what's called this points-based immigration, which is 
coming, it came started in Australia, it's now in uh, uh, much of Europe and in and coming into this country, is to remove the uh, remove uh, from the poorest countries the best qualified and most able people by offering them incentives and points in order to come and live permanently in the West and uh, denying access to other people from uh, who don't have those same kind of skills that are maybe needed or maybe uh, seen as being necessary for the survival of those Western economies. Now, how do we change this? We change this by discussion, we change it by debate, we change it by the media, we change it by understanding what it's about. But we also change it by a sense of internationalism in our arguments and in our debates. Trade unions operate for the most part within national boundaries and for the most part undertake their work within a national context, often deliberately or sometimes not so deliberately but nevertheless it adds up to the same thing, ignoring the consequences of what they do or ignoring the consequences that exist elsewhere. It's creating that sense of international solidarity amongst organised workers and promoting trade unions and trade union organisation in other parts of the world as well so that solidarity action can be taken from one group to the other. It's also supporting people that have sought migration to the richer countries. The demonstrations that took place last year in the United States, well, that were famously known as a day without Mexicans, was I think probably the most powerful expression of the power and rights of migrant workers that had been for a very long time, demonstrating to the people of the United States that they were living on the subculture of an economy that was unregulated, denied minimum wage, denied health and safety protection. Exactly the same is going on in this city, in London, in every major city in Europe. The response of the European Union uh, to the current economic stress, the current economic downturn, which is very minor compared to the downturn that's happened in other parts of the world, is to start rounding up and deporting larger and larger numbers of migrant workers. And so, who pays the price for the economic problems in Europe? Colombian women that have come here and end up cleaning, uh, cleaning hospitals, cleaning offices and cleaning people's homes. People that work on fruit picking, work on uh, farm work all over Europe and all over the United States. And so what I would say is, as part of this debate, have a thought to the fourth world. Have a thought to those people that end up forever denied rights, forever denied the right of expression, forever denied the right of organisation, yet a crucial part of everyone's economy. These are the people that are suffering, to some extent, the worst and the most. And whilst we pride ourselves on human rights values and uh, respect for human rights, the reality of the economic strategy we're following is to specifically deny to 200 million people, not just this country, all the others around the world, the rights that we want for ourselves. I think this is just a very important part of the debate. Thank you very much.